Hello, good evening, everybody, and happy Hanukkah. Um, welcome. Um, and I want to say thank you for your time today. I know everyone's busy, busy time of year with the holidays and, um, you know, school ending and college kids home and so on. So give me about a half hour. And uh, I have Matt from Strauman that will give a little talk at the end as well. So please stay on. Um, so today we're going to talk about influence of medical conditions and medications and osteointegration. Um, and the reason why I picked this topic is that um, the reason why I picked this topic is because, um, you know, we see patients every day, um, we treatment plan them, we tell them what they need, but sometimes we don't take a step back and look at uh, the patient themselves. What are they coming in with? So we're going to talk about uh, medical conditions and medications on implants. But um, I put this slide up. Um, this is uh, the three places I trained. I showed us a few months ago, uh, Penn State. Uh, where I went for undergrad, um, Stony Brook Dental School, where I did my undergrad uh, in uh, dentistry, obviously, and Mount Sinai is in the lower right. Um, Penn State has a big bowl game this coming up in two weeks, so very exciting. Um, so let's go into the lecture here. Um, and these are some of the medical conditions that could affect osteointegration. And these are some of the most common uh, um, medical conditions our patients come in today. Um, I looked up diabetes, actually, and the literature shows that there's about 140 million Americans are diabetic or pre-diabetic, which was an uh, amazing uh, statistic. And osteoporosis affects over 40 million patients uh, in this country as well. So every day um, when we see a patient, either they're going to be diabetic or pre-diabetic, or they're going to have osteoporosis, besides the other medical conditions I've listed down here. So it's very important to know, do these conditions and the medications that our patients take, are they going to affect the integration of our implants? And if they do, it's our job as a clinician to educate them that, you know what, maybe this might not be a definitive treatment. Maybe this might not be the best treatment plan for them. So we're going to dive into it uh, in a few seconds. Uh, also, medications. Um, I know Dr. Fleischman in the past, uh, the last lecture talked about bisphosphonates. Uh, but the medications listed here, many of our patients are on one or two or uh, take uh, uh, many different types of medications. And we should know, do, are these medications going to affect uh, the integration of these implants? So we're going to dive into this as well uh, throughout the lecture. So, you know, we're going to talk about patients' uh, systemic conditions, medications, but, you know, also remembers it's the clinician that's putting the implants in as well. So I always say to my patients, it takes two to tango. It takes them to heal, but also before it, it's also up to me to do a good surgery as well. Uh, and then in the literature, it shows that the reasons why implants fail uh, due to the clinician is probably number one, the lack of initial stability of the implant, uh, the lack of uh, adequate torque of the implant, and actually they, they cited inexperienced surgeons as well. And the reason I put this slide up here as well is to show that you have, this patient's about 45 years old. He had no uh, medical history to speak of, but it's interesting, why did one implant uh, on the right here take, and why did the implant on the left, you can see the excessive amount of bone loss, why did that not take? And it's probably is due to one of these three factors that led to this implant not failing and not the patient. So in the literature, it actually shows that implants have a 95% success rate. And we need two things to happen when implants go in. We need that primary stability. And I always talk to patients about it. I need that uh, when the implant goes in, we need it to kind of form a mechanical bond at first. And then after that primary stability or the mechanical bond, we need a secondary uh, stability to form. And that's where the osteointegration uh, occurs. So you need these two things, the primary and secondary stability of the implant. And primary stability is the mechanical stability or lack of micro movement. And it occurs in the first week. Uh, you can't have any motion of that implant. That's why we need uh, to have that initial stability. And it does show in the literature that if, if the bone doesn't 
if we if we heat that bone more than 47 degrees um, Celsius, is that we're going to have necrosis of the bone and we're going to lose this primary stability. So it's very important uh, that we do this step uh, adequately. And then what we're leading to get here is the end game is the secondary stability. We need this biological or this osteointegration. And this is what the slide is showing here. It's showing the, the ingrowth of the bone here where the red arrows are into the implant surface. And this is what we're trying to get. We're trying to get osteointegration. So we need all this bio biology to happen uh, to have success. And it's pretty amazing that in the literature it shows that we have 95% success rate with dental implants today. So I put this slide in because a lot of times patients always ask me, doc, what can I do on my end to improve healing? And I used to say to them, nothing, just good hygiene, brush your teeth, um, you know, uh, take care of yourself. But I was, as, a, as I was, you know, going through the literature and doing some research, it's actually nutrition is a big part of, pap of patients' uh, uh, well-being today. And there's a lot of uh, information that shows a multivitamin, uh, especially the ones I've listed here, A, B, C, and D, they're very good for wound healing and for actually for osteointegration. Uh, they stimulate fibroblasts, cross-linking, decrease in wound infection, antioxidants, infection resistance. So if you think about it, if a patient, um, you know, to take a multivitamin to improve their healing, improve success of the implant and osteointegration, to me, it's a no-brainer. So I always try to recommend to patients that they eat well and they take multivitamins because it, it doesn't hurt. Anything to help uh, in wound healing and, and uh, healing is, is always a positive. So let's dive into diabetes. Uh, like I said before, diabetes affects over 130 million Americans uh, pre and post diabetics. And in the literature, again, it shows no decrease in implant and osteointegration in a well-controlled diabetic. So if you have a patient who's, who's history of diabetes, he's well-controlled, he takes his medications, he goes to the doctor, you should feel very comfortable about treatment planning implants for these patients. Um, where we run into issues with diabetics are the ones that do not uh, are well controlled, the ones that are poorly controlled diabetics. It's, it's interesting because the implant will integrate, but we'll have peri-implantitis. We'll have issues later on uh, with the implant, uh, probably most likely when we have the healing cap on or full arch on, we'll have this peri-implantitis around the implants. So the poorly controlled diabetic is the one that uh, that we have to watch out for. So this slide is a simple slide. It's showing that um, any hypoglycemic state or any patient that's not taking care of his diabetes, you're going to have slow wound healing, slow bone healing. And I put this slide down here, the, H, the hemoglobin A1C is a great marker. Um, I actually had a patient this week that told me about the, you know, the hemoglobin A1C doc is below six, it's, it's well controlled. So patients today know this number. So you can find out what the latest hemoglobin H1C is. And if it's greater than eight, we're gonna have problems with placing implants on these patients. So it's a very good number to know. Um, so you can see here, any hemoglobin uh, H1AC greater than eight, you'll have decrease in implant stability and it's gonna take longer time for this implant to heal. Um, but overall, diabetes and implants, um, we have very high success rate. So my take home message with the diabetic patient is good recall on these patients. Uh, on full arch cases, I probably would take off the prosthesis within the first year, at least to look at their hygiene, uh, look at the soft tissue, uh, make sure there's no uh, periimplantitis. I would increase hygiene visits with diabetic patients. And actually, um, it has been shown that di doxycycline, low dose, 20 milligrams, BID, reduces inflammation of the soft tissue around the implant as well. So many patients uh, are on this, on this course of doxycycline, 
uh, three to six months, and then we take them off it for a few months and put them on it. Um, so definitely, uh, it's something to look into. So <clears throat> I brought up before that uh, osteoporosis affects about 40 million uh, Americans today. And um, I get asked this question on a common basis. I have osteoporosis. Can I have dental implants? And I get this other question asked many times as well. Does osteoporosis affect the jaws, the, max, the mandible and maxilla? And the answer is actually, and I'll hold off to you before I give you the answer, is that I got this slide that I, I myself didn't know how prevalent osteoporosis is, is in, uh, in the population today. And you can see here in, this, in, in these statistics that one in two uh, men over, uh, one in two women over 50 will fracture a bone. And one in, I didn't realize that one in four men will have osteoporosis. And in the middle here as well, that over 45, uh, women over 45, the, the major cause of being in a hospital is because of osteoporosis, not because of diabetes or breast cancer. So osteoporosis is very, very common today. And I would probably would say majority, a lot of our patients today that are having dental implants either are treated for osteoporosis or are being worked up for it. So this slide, osteoporosis does not affect the mandible and maxilla. It actually affects the cervical spine, the thoracic, the lumbar, the long bones. There's very, very, very little effect on the maxilla and mandible. Uh, so in that sense, it's very safe to place dental implants on osteoporosis patients uh, in the maxilla and mandible. Um, and I wanted to show um, this x-ray is actually this patient that was an osteoporotic patient. Uh, for many, many years, and she wore an upper plate and a lower plate, and we decided uh, to place four implants uh, for a, a pro-watch type of case, and she was very happy that we did this for her. So the take-home message in osteoporosis patients that, yes, it's very safe to place dental implants. Um, and you have to remember that majority of the osteoporosis patients are on bisphosphonates as well. And we learned from our last lecture from Dr. Fleischman, who talked about bisphosphonates, um, that there's no increase in failures in patients on oral bisphosphonates and dental implants. And there's no significant difference between complications on bisphosphonates versus control groups. Um, obviously, on patients who are on, on the IV bisphosphonates, you have to stay away from uh, placing dental implants or minimize dental surgery in general. Uh, but bisphosphonates are very safe um, uh, in terms of placing dental implants today. Um, you know, one of the most common bisphosphonates, you know, Phosphomax, Boniva. Uh, we have a, a lot of patients on these different types of medications. But uh, we, got, we got into the practice of uh, inform, you know, you have to inform and consent these patients. Uh, we give them antibiotics beforehand. Paradex rinses, and I always say know your patient. Uh, obviously, if your patient is a good healer, uh, there's no reason you can't place dental implants. But if your patient's one of these slow healers, anything you do with them hurts. Uh, they take a long time to heal. Maybe don't do the dental implant. Maybe um, maybe do one implant instead of two. Really take your time with these patients. So the take-home message with the bisphosphonates and, oral, and the osteoporosis is very safe to place dental implants. So the next category, next systemic disease we're going to move into is cardiovascular disease. Um, in the literature, it shows that there's no contraindication for implants for treatment. They have normal success rate. And actually, patients on hypertensive medications show a positive bone growth that can help with implant integration which was an interesting tidbit. Uh, so cardiovascular disease, very safe to do dental implants with. And then the other diseases that I was looking at, hyperthyroidism, rheumatoid arthritis, neurological diseases, Alzheimer's, dementia, uh, connective tissue diseases, scleroderma, and Sjogren's. In the literature that shows that there's no contraindication and in the medications that majority of these patients take, there's very little uh, sequelae on dental implants. So for all these conditions as well, 
you get saved to place dental implants. Uh, the next group of medications that actually I'm going to move into is that protein pump inhibitors. These are common drugs that a lot of patients are on today. Uh, your Prilosec, Prevacet, Protonix, Nexium. We see a lot of patients on these medications. And actually, there's 18 million people on these medications today. Uh, it's a very common drug. Um, and the way the drug works is that uh, it decreases the absorption of calcium. And they've shown that many patients on this decrease in calcium actually show signs of bone fracture, especially uh, in the ankle and the wrist, um, and they lead to osteoporosis. And in the study that I looked at, they actually showed that patients on these PPPIs or protein pump inhibitors actually showed a significant failure of implant um, failure. So osteointegration did decrease on patients on these protein pump inhibitors. So it's something to see if a patient's on a long-lasting PPPI, uh, it might be wise to ask them, are you still need to be on this medication? Can you switch the medication? Um, or at least let them know that there could be a decrease in success of your dental implant. The next major group of drugs that we looked into is actually uh, SSRIs or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. They're very common drugs. Again, 20 million Americans are on it. They use Zoloft and, Pro and Prozacs. They also affect bone metabolism. They decrease bone density and they increase in bone fracture. But in the study, they showed that there was no effect on osteointegration. So patients on these medications, you don't need to be alarmed that they might have an out a poor outcome uh, with dental implants. So this was interesting. I'm going to move into actually uh, antibiotics now. Um, and I wrote this slide that not all antibiotics are good for implants. And, and you wouldn't think that uh, antibiotics would have a, um, an adverse effect on implants. Um, and actually, there was another study that showed that do penicillin allergic patients present a higher rate of implant failure. So it was interesting. I was doing a, a, a full arch case um, and I was talking, I had a uh, anesthesiologist helping me do the case. And uh, he noticed that I put the patient on clindamycin. And he mentioned to me that about these studies that show that patients uh, allergic to penicillin and placed on clindamycin actually had a higher implant failure rate. And he actually brought up uh, a colleague of his that worked at Clear Choice. And I think the majority of the audience knows that Clear Choice does uh, many full arch type of cases and plays thousands and thousands of implants a year. And actually in their literature, they did a, um, I guess, a, uh, a Clear Choice study. They showed that patients on clindamycin actually had a higher failure rate of implants. Um, so there must be, the clindamycin must have an adverse effect on the osteointegration of the implant. Uh, so in our practice, actually, we try not to, uh, I come in the habit of not placing patients on clindamycin anymore when I do, um, who are allergic to penicillin. Uh, so I put them on a different type of drug, either uh, a Z-Pak or a Cipro or Leviquin. Um, but I was looking in the literature today as well. And, you know, a lot of us today, you know, you have so many patients that come in that say I'm allergic to penicillin or my mother told me I was allergic to penicillin or my sister was allergic, so I must be allergic. You know, they say that 10% of the population reports of a penicillin allergy, but less than 1% is a real true pen, uh, pen allergic. Um, so, you know, if I was doing a, a full arch case on a patient, I probably would send them to get allergy tested because I'd rather, rather put them on amoxicillin or penicillin than just say, oh, you must be allergic to it. Um, so there's something to say to really uh, to see if our patients are truly allergic to penicillin. Um, I, on the bottom of the slide, actually, I wrote uh, prophylactic antibiotics. Does that help with, uh, with osteointegration with implants? And there's actually evidence that shows that preoperative antibiotics do show less of a failure. 
So we got in the habit of our practice that if I could, I always try to start a patient on an antibiotics a day or two before implants. And like I said, I don't put them on clindamycin anymore. I put them on a different uh, antibiotic if they're allergic to penicillin. So just right here, we stay away from clindamycin with antibiotics today. Uh, we use ZPAC, Olevaquin, Ocipro. Um, so uh, just a take home message is in interesting to see. So the last topic I'm going to talk about is radiation. Unfortunately, we have patients today that get radiation to the head and neck area. Um, so it's very important to know uh, what the radiation dose is. Uh, so we always ask the oncologist how much gray or rads of radiation did they get? Where was the zone of radiation, the maxilla, the mandible? Um, so it's always very important to get this information before we put dental implants in. Uh, the know the radiation, the field, the dose. Was the patient also on chemotherapy? Max, 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 sorry, maxilla versus mandible. Uh, how is the healing afterwards? Um, so, you know, osteointegration with radiation. And it actually shows that there's very little detrimental effect of the radiation on osteointegration. Uh, there's not much literature out, but... I would say from my experience, from the several cases I've done, it's safe to place uh, implants in um, on patients who have a uh, dose of radiation below 5,000 rads. Um, and like I always tell patients who go under this treatment is to go slow. Uh, so this is an example of a patient. You can see in the bottom left uh, x-ray, he had a full mouth of uh, maxillary teeth. Unfortunately, all his lower teeth were extracted before he had a floor of cancer removed with radiation and chemo. Um, he had radiation below 5,000, so we were able to take out all his upper teeth first. He healed very well. Then we progressed to place dental implants in the mandible. Uh, he had high, something called hyperbaric oxygen first, which is a topic for another time. Um, but the whole take-home message is, is that we went slow with this patient. We did the extractions. He let him heal. We placed the implants. We let him heal. Uh, we let him heal for about six months before we put a fixed prosthesis on the lower implants. Um, so we went very slow. We took our time uh, with these patients. And I think that's uh, what you have to do with anyone who's on the radiation or chemo uh, in the head and neck region. You have to go slow. You have to inform consent. Um, you can't rush anything and you have to watch out for proper healing. So this was the article that I did majority of uh, my research from. Um, unfortunately, there's not much research out. Um, this article was done in 2019 and it, it went through all the systemic diseases that I touched on, cardiovascular, diabetes, osteoporosis, hypothyroidism, HIV, rheumatoid, in the connective tissue. Um, it's about a 15 page article. And the take home message was, which is good for an oral surgeon and anyone who places implants is that successive implants placed on osteointegration in these groups of patients seem to be same, seem to be the same as the healthy population with no systemic conditions or taking any medications. Um, so it's good to know that majority of the patients that we treat would do very well with implants. It's a safe treatment plan. It's a predictable treatment plan. But again, I think the take home message is inform consent your patients, know their medical history, um, give them antibiotics prof prophylactically a day or two before um, and good surgical technique and we'll have a great positive outcome. If anyone wants a copy of this article, let me know, I can always email it over to you. Uh, it was a very easy article to read. Um, and this is what we're all aiming for. This was a patient who was a diabetic, also had osteoporosis, had very poor terminal dentition. We took out all our upper and lower teeth. We placed in several implants, upper and lower, fixed prosthesis. This is her two years out. Um, so this is our goal with a predictable um, outcome. So again, I want to thank everyone today. Uh, happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, uh, especially spending time here. Um, I'm going to move over the next slide over to, uh, Matt.
uh, from um, Strauman. He's going to talk for about a few minutes. Let me help. Him um, just wanted to do just a brief overview. I'm Matt from Strauman. Um, I cover Western Nassau in Brooklyn. So I cover um, primarily from Levittown. I cover the Levittown office all the way west. So um, always supporting uh, leading edge refers and I just wanted to kind of just introduce myself and just go over a couple things. Um, awesome. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to uh, go over, this is our restorative chart um, for, for bone level tapered and bone level, um, just kind of like a refresher. And so you have the SD connection, which is the small CrossFit, which is blue. And uh, this shows like the different components here. If you go, if you are doing digital, um, right over here is your digital impressions to the left. To take a digital impression, uh, your scan bodies and there's open tray, you have long and short and also closed tray as well. And then, uh, then we have our uh, narrow cross it, which is yellow. Again, just the same idea. And then we have um, in purple, we have our uh, regular CrossFit and just kind of like a, just, just a refresher. And um, the common misconception is, you know, you can't use, for example, an NC with an RC. So it's got to be color coordinated, um, just kind of uh, some day-to-day -day things I see. So just kind of a little refresher. If you guys have any questions on this, um, you know, you guys can always contact me. I have my number in the front. Um, so yeah, uh, next slide. And then also this is um, primarily what Dr. German uses uh, for, for full arch. This is our BLX system. And um, you have here, you have uh, the RB and you have the WB connection. And the RB is regular base and the WB is wide base, as you can see, um, different than the BLT. So that's another common question that comes up. Um, you know, this is the good thing is here it's one prosthetic connection. So say you're in a bind, you could use an RB on, on a on a WB implant. It will it will fit. Um, the difference is on the on the BLX, it's uh, it's a six sided connection, and on the BLT, it's a four sided, which means you can have that um, kind of flexibility to use the RB on a WB implant for impression taking. And then all the way to the left, I kind of skipped over, um, you have your scan bodies as well. And then uh, just uh, kind of a refresher. Some people just don't know. I just want to just let everyone know it's it's available. And we uh, we distribute for Trios, Medit. We have our own scanner. Uh, it's called the Vivo. And uh, it's kind of a, you know, kind of an entry level uh, scanner, but it, it's real quick, gets the job done. You want to kind of dip your toes into digital, digital impression taking. And um, so, yeah, I just wanted to kind of just provide that. Also in terms of uh, news, the Trios 5, you guys um, are Trios users, if you have a three or four, they just came out with the Trios 5, uh, new technology, faster. So just kind of a, just kind of a heads up. And uh, yeah, that's it. If anyone has any questions. I actually do have one question that just came through. Any guidelines for implant patients age for placement, either too young or too old? Um, in terms of like a 16 year old or like, uh, I mean, too old, no. <laughs> um, I would say, you know, if they're healthy enough and they wanted an implant and uh, you know, and it's justifiable, I have no issue. Uh, young wise, you know, it's always debatable. I have orthodontists and restorative guys who all, you know, you you know, sixteen on a uh, on a um, on a teenage girl and eighteen on a on a adult, you know, on a on a male. Um, you know, that's pretty much what. The literature says 16, 18, when the two years after they're done growing. Um, I think it just, you got to, when it comes to placing an implant on a young person, um, the best thing you, ha you have, you know, like we always say, treatment plan, make sure everyone's on the same page. 
Um, there's no reason to rush it on a younger person. Um, but there's no, I, I would definitely say 16 on a female, 18 on a boy when they're done growing, when you know they're done growing with the maxilla and mandible. Thank you guys again. Happy holidays. And we look forward to seeing you next year at our next lecture. Happy holidays.